In January, we launched uh, an emphasis in our church called Giant Steps. The idea is that we want to quit struggling with the same struggles that we have had all our lives. We want to get past some of those things. We want to quit moving by baby steps and increments and instead start moving by giant steps to conquer some of the problems we've had in our lives, perhaps all life long. I need more house light, Nate. So that, that way a year from now and two years from now and five years from now, we're still not stuck in the same places where we find ourselves stuck today. So in the series, we are saying that it's time to step out of things holding us back, time to step into the amazing uh, privileges and resources that we get when we get Jesus, and then to step up to our truest self and our best life possible and to our mission and high calling in Christ because that is the way that we make a difference for Christ and the gospel, a difference that lasts forever. Now, today I want to talk about stepping out from one of the deepest, darkest problems that lurks in the shadowy corners of every human heart. To introduce that problem, I'm going to start with a a line from Shakespeare from the lips of Macbeth reflecting on the absurdity of life. He says, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And when he says that, he's saying something both about what life is and about what, who we are. Life, he says, is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. No meaning, no value, no purpose. It's absurd. And about us, he says, we are idiots. We are fools and fall guys for a giant cosmic joke. Many historians, scientists, others, many thinkers, philosophers, looking at life around us at the human condition say, He's right, no value is evident, no sacredness of life is discernible through all this strange mixture of history. We are idiots, one and all. We have no soul, no spirit, no essential dignity. Molecular machines, lumps of matter, energized by electricity. If you had to go buy the dust we're made of, you'd be worth about 50 cents. Now, this view of who we are uh, plays out in our culture. Francis Schaeffer, a thinker, philosopher, theologian, 50 years ago, predicted this. He said, we are watching our culture put into effect the fact that when you tell men long enough that they are machines, it soon begins to show in their actions. You see it in our whole culture, in the theater of cruelty, in the violence in the streets, in the death of man, in art and life. 50 years ago, he predicted it. This is the uh, unavoidable endgame of the philosophy that's pretty much running our culture, our secular culture. That philosophy is called existentialism. It can be called absurdism. And it's being played out before our very eyes. Because if you tell, for example, children long enough that they are worthless, they're going to act in ways that devalue their truest self. If you tell children long enough that they are stupid, they're going to give up their natural-born quest and hunger for truth. If you tell them that they are to be exploited and that they are to be used, they will betray themselves again and again to be exploited and to be used. It matters what you tell people about who they are and what they are. Now, into this bleak and depressing view of life comes a new message with new hope and a new perspective on human nature, one that's never been before recorded in the annals of history. This message says that humans are the special creation of God. It says that we are made in his image. We are created with purpose. We are designed for dignity and honor. We have an origin that is sacred, and in Christ we have a destiny that's glorious. Our life is not absurd. Our universe is not a cosmic accident, our identity is not that of idiots. In the message of the gospel, in the message of Jesus, you are a sacred being, you are precious to God, and you are worthy of dignity and respect. Amen? But there's a problem 
that makes all this difficult and messed up, and that is what I want to think about with you today. The problem starts with the fact that we live in a fallen world. This whole world is broken. The whole universe, the cosmic system, is in rebellion in a way against the laws of God. And in this rebellion, every one of us, we're all caught in the crosshairs of a giant cosmic conflict. And there are many, many consequences of this. But one of the most powerful of the consequences, one of the most um, impactful in our day-to-day lives is a damaged sense of who you are. And so I've got five lessons for you today. Here's the first one, which is that most people carry around a damaged sense of identity. The odds are very strong that you've absorbed your sense of identity from your family and from the culture around you. The odds are also very strong that those sources really don't have the slightest clue of who you really are in the eyes of God. So they begin to slap their own labels on you, and they label you as to who they see you as being. And some of those labels are painful. You're stupid, you're ugly, you're fat, you're too short, you're too tall, you're the wrong color, wrong abilities, wrong IQ. I wish you'd never been born. Don't bother me. You're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. You're stuck. I wish you were more like your brother, your sister. Why can't you do anything right? You're evil. You're dirty. I never wanted you. You're a failure. Some of you have heard those labels. These labels sink deep inside a person. They latch onto your tender spirit. They haunt you. One of the labels that haunted me for the first half of my life was stupid. You're stupid. I'd like to say for the record, I'm not stupid. (laughs) But I wish I could have told that to my 20-year-old self. What a struggle to be told quite frequently, you sure are stupid. Now, those labels have a nasty way of creating self-fulfilling prophecies. And I know I haven't actually stated our topic for today, so I'll do that now. My topic today is that you would step out of labels of doom and gloom. Because these are the voices in your head that are stuck on a permanent loop. And they surface, especially when you do something you regret or when you make a mistake or when you look foolish in somebody else's eyes or even in your own eyes. All of a sudden, these voices rise up. These voices echo negative sources of information from your past. They come from the bullies in your past, from the mean girls, from the stoned out parents, from an absentee father, from an unkind mother with her own issues, from abusers, exploiters, takers, liars, perverts, pushers, the partiers, the spiritual vampires. Every person who has planted seeds of self-doubt and broken self-esteem and painful rejection into a tender soul at a time when you were vulnerable and deserved nothing but love. So what I want to do today is help identify those labels. I want to help you surface them and to admit them to yourself and to begin to see how these are the labels that are actually defining you and in many cases running your life. And then next week, we're going to do something really special because we're going to officially destroy those labels and take on whole new sets of life-giving, beautiful labels for yourself. Don't miss that. And then the week after that, it goes even higher and better. So hang on. Now, I want my message today to be interactive. And on the way in, we asked you to take out, to take with you this uh, slip of paper and a pencil. And as I'm teaching today, I've been asking God by his Holy Spirit if he would help you to surface some of the deep labels you've been carrying. And what I'd like to invite you to do is as one of these labels surfaces for you, write them down. Just write them on that slip of paper. And this is between you and God. I'm not going to have you turn them in. Don't show it to anybody else. Write them down and just let these labels kind of sit heavy with you this week. And then bring it back next week. So my list would be started with stupid or something like that. And you can write down even things you've already heard me say that feel like they resonate with you. So 
and even actually after today, all through the week, as you notice new labels coming up that you've kind of soaked in maybe and you don't even realize it, write them down too. Because next week we're going to do something special with the labels on this list. So what I want to do right now is to go really fast through a dozen places of Scripture, and it's a baker's dozen because I added one today. So there's 13. Where uh, people in the Bible were holding onto, uh, they had slapped on them labels of doom and gloom, negative labels. And we're doing this to trigger some of this inside of you and to help you think through where the name calling has sticked, where uh, stick to you, where the labels stick to you, things that raise up emotions for you, things that make your heart skip a beat, write that down. It could be a nickname you've adopted. It could be a name you've adopted for yourself, an identity that isn't the real you. It could be a voice or the whisper that shouts to you. Who knows? It could be a way you routinely talk about yourself. You talk to yourself about yourself and say, boy, that sure was blank. You sure are blank. Write them down. So here we go. We're going to look at a bunch of examples from the Bible of people who held on to labels and see which ones resonate with you. Uh, in John 8, Jesus meets a woman who is caught in the act of adultery. They throw him at her feet. And they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Labels, adulterer, dirty, evil, caught, busted, exposed, condemned. So if any of those stick with you, write them down. There's a man in the Old Testament named Gideon. And... Uh, he was hiding from the enemy. And God said, you are favored by God. And Gideon said to him, oh, Lord, my God, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Abandoned by God, that's a label. Forsaken. Defeated. Unworthy. Loser. There is a widow who bumped into a prophet in a town called Zarephath. And so she's called the widow of Zarephath. And the prophet, and this is what prophets did, said, hey, can you, can you make me a meal? And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar, and see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. <laughs> Hopeless, good as dead, despair. I give up. Life's not worth living. In the ancient world, one of the worst things that could befall a person as far as a disease went was leprosy. And Jesus encounters a leper. And in Matthew 8, 3, it says, then Jesus put out his hand and touched him. And this is, this is the beginning of his healing. Nobody touched a leper. They, the leper. They were unclean. They were considered contagious. And that touch from Jesus might have been the first time in a lifetime that anybody touched him with love and affection. And that can be the case for some here today. A disease, you are a disease, you are untouchable, outcast, unwanted, you're a reject, you are different. Some of you were here for a long time <clears throat> when we went through a series on spiritual warfare, Christian in complete armor, and we met different people in the Bible who were afflicted with evil spirits, and here we have a demon-possessed man who is living among tombs, and he's naked, and he's matted in his own filth, and he's, he's out of his mind. And when Jesus stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. Here is a man labeled crazy, disgusting, evil, exploited, helpless, beyond hope, too far gone. 
Just write down the ones that stick or other, you don't have to limit yourself to what I'm putting on the screen here. I'm just trying to be suggestive of some of the labels that might come up for you. Jesus met a sinful woman. That's how she was identified. It doesn't say, oh, here's this woman. No, here's a sinner of a woman. And this is Luke 7, 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. That's her identity. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster, alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and she breaks it and anoints his feet. It's very expensive stuff. And she's weeping and anointing his feet with this oil. Her labels are sinner, immoral, filthy, defiled, sleazy. I've got others on my paper that I won't say out loud here. She's wasted and she's wasteful. There's a man in the Old Testament who, as a boy, was rescued from a change of dynasty in the kingship. And they were slaughtering all the heirs to the previous king. His name was Mephibosheth. And as he was being rescued, the woman who was carrying him, he was a baby, slipped and fell and landed on his legs, and both his legs broke, and he grew up, and the Bible says, Bible language, he was lame in both his feet. And now he was off in the distance, is living far away in exile as a grown man. And he's brought before the new king, who is David, and then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Labels. Dead dog. Lame. Broke. Worthless. There's a man in Mark 10 when Jesus is traveling. Jesus is going down the road and he starts shouting out. He hears, he hears he's, he's blind. In fact, he's born blind. In fact, his name is blind. Bartimaeus. They don't just call him Bartimaeus, that's his name. They call him Blind Bartimaeus. This is, these are the labels that are sometimes your nickname or your name or just how people refer to you. And as he's going down the road, as Jesus is going down the road, Blind Bartimaeus is sitting there crying out, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me. And everybody, including the disciples, tells him, just shut up, man. Now, they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, that's Jesus, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, see, that's what he's called. The son of Timaeus sat by the road begging, blind, beggar, damaged, annoying. You are an interruption. You wreck all my plans. In the book of Revelation, now, this is kind of the flip side of everything I've been talking about so far, which all those are negative labels, but these are also negative labels, but they don't seem like it, where there are these Christians in a city called Laodicea, so these are the Laodicean Christians, who have a false assessment of themselves. Because you say, I am rich, these are how they label themselves. I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Labels, rich, wealthy, in need of nothing. Got it all together. And going right along with this is uh, the ancient king of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar, who is out one day strutting around on the, one of the balconies of his palaces, looking over this glorious city he has built called Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, he's talking to himself, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? My power, my honor, my majesty, this is the narcissist. I think our culture today feeds narcissism. Are you writing down some labels? Are any of these sticking with you? A couple of them? All right. I think most of us have heard of, uh, oh, and also self-made there, most of us have heard of David, the king. But you might not know that uh, when he became king, God told a prophet named Samuel, Samuel, I'm going to get rid of the current king, and I'm going to have you anoint 
appoint the next king. And the way you're going to do that is to go to the house of a man named Jesse. And I will, God says, I will choose the next king from among his sons. So Samuel rolls into town. And he's, you know, he's this VIP. And everybody's impressed. Samuel goes to the house of Jesse and says, Jesse, show me all your sons. God has declared he will select the next king from among your sons. And of course, Jesse is real proud. He lines up his boys one by one. They're, they're grown men. Most of them are military. Big, powerful, good-looking, strong men. They parade before Samuel, and one by one, Samuel says, no, not that one. 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 Until they go through all the sons of Jesse. And now they're all sitting there like confused. Samuel's confused. Jesse's confused. All the sons standing there are confused. What gives? It's just like crickets. No one can figure out how, what's going on. And so then you get this. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, and he, there he is keeping the sheep. Samuel says to the dad, show me all your sons, and the dad skips one. Father of the year. <laughs> and Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Labels, you're nobody. You don't matter. You're invisible. You're not seen. You're fatherless. You're inferior. In the New Testament, are you guys doing okay? Okay, you're very quiet. Somebody fuss around a little bit, please. Don't. No. Uh, there are false prophets and false teachers. And... When they get followers, we're now talking about victims of false prophets, and we read this in 2 Peter 2. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, as though this is sexually immoral temptation. These are false prophets. The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome... By him also he is brought into bondage. And when you read in the Bible language about bondage and all of that, you're actually talking about addiction and getting sucked into a vortex of dysfunction and brokenness. So the label's here. You've been fooled. You're a pervert. You're a slave. It's right there, slaves of corruption. You're corrupt. And you're an addict, which is the modern version of the biblical word bondage. You're in bondage. And this last one, one more example here. Don't worry, I'm not done. Um, we have the first man ever created, Adam. And after he sinned with Eve, God comes down, okay, what happened? He knew, but he wants them to say it. And Adam says, then the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. And this is one of the most uh, messed up labels you can have, which is to label yourself a victim. And so I want to pick up on this, this label a little bit for kind of the rest of my talk, because I think this is the most subtle danger um, on labeling yourself a victim. Now, so let me pause, though, to say, are you thinking of some labels that have been stuck on you? Just nod a little bit. Okay. Write them down. We're not done with that. But I want to show you how impactful this is. Because it's not just that these are labels that you put on yourself. There's a super important lesson for you today, which is that <clears throat> when you accept a negative label and let it in, you also accept the status of a victim. Someone mean, someone powerful, powerful over you, someone uh, with power that you don't have and you couldn't make them shut up, got a label on you and got it to stick, and that wasn't your fault, that was their fault. To be called their name is to be wounded by somebody else. You are their victim. There's a vulnerability, and I get this. This is not your fault. There's pain. You're at the mercy of a power or person you can't stop. 
Now, let's just agree that all of us are victims of other people's sins. Let us also agree that for all of us, other people have been victims of our sins. Right? So this is human life. We've hurt people. We've been hurt by people. And you can't help what other people do to you, especially when you're a kid or relatively powerless. But this is where you have to be careful. Because when you get this wound that's attached to a label, right away the devil floods in. He's an opportunist, and he plays dirty. And the devil will tell you you're broken. He'll tell you you're damaged goods. He'll tell you this now defines you. This is who you are. And he'll tell you you have no choice in the matter. Because the goal of the devil is to weaken you and disarm you which is what a victim is. But there's a deeper danger. The deeper danger is there's an emotion that wraps around victimhood. And even if you look at the labels you've written down today, you, you might actually have some feelings, some emotions bubbling up because you have been wronged, you have been treated poorly, and there are multiple emotions that go with this. And, and I know, and they, you know they're attached to the, some of the bad events, the abusive events in your life. I understand that. But the key emotion around victimhood is the emotion of anger. So lesson three is when you accept the status of victim, you also carry around unresolved anger. Because as long as this label lives in you, the anger lives in you too. And at first, it's a righteous anger. But even righteous anger turns toxic when you hang on to it. So the Bible gives us some profoundly important psychological wisdom on dealing with these labels and victim status and anger. So we have Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry and do not sin. It's in italics because it's a quote from the Old Testament. Do not let the sun go down on your your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Okay, three things about anger here. First... There is a way to be angry without sinning. Anger can be good and holy. In fact, if we see cruelty, if we see evil happening and we're not angry, there's something wrong with us. Anger is an early warning system that evil or badness is happening. When, that's why God gave us anger. It's an emotion that evokes motion. It makes us fight evil and fight cruelty and fight abuse. So not all anger is sin. However, it can become sin. So that the only way to make anger not a sin is to come to a place of forgiveness quickly, quickly. And by quickly, I mean, as it says here, before the sun goes down, which means that same day, before you go to bed that night, you have to get with God. Uh, If you can get with a person and figure out the anger or you just agree to talk about it tomorrow, that's fine. But you've got to get with God at least and you have to release the offender to God. Whose job is vengeance? God's. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And if somebody hurts you and you've got cycling in your spirit or soul, thoughts of how to get even, wishes of how horrible things are going to happen to them and their kids down to their fourth generation. That's hurting you. You have to forgive. And when I say forgive, this does not mean you forget. We're going to talk about this more. Not today, though. This does not mean you forget that this bad thing happened to you. This does not mean that you trust the offender who did it. Forgiveness does not mean that you have to trust that person. Do not put yourself in harm's way with dangerous individuals. You have no obligation to do that. And especially don't put your kids in harm's way. Forgiveness does not mean you forget. It does not mean you trust the offender. It does not even mean you're friends with that person. Now, if somebody hurts you, oh, let, me, let me say it this way. Friendship with you is a privilege. If someone gets to be friends with you, that's a privilege. You don't owe that to anybody except for one person, which is the person you said vows to in marriage. Now, that friendship you've got to work, out, work on. But all other friendships are optional. If you want to be friends, it takes two. If, you, if I don't want to be friends with you, we're not going to be friends. <laughs> and it's nothing about you, and it's really nothing bad about me. It's just I don't owe a friendship to anybody. You don't owe a friendship to anybody. So 
that means you can be loving and not be friends. So when you forgive that person, you can still love them from a distance. If you feel that that's what has to happen in order for you to feel like you can get on with your life. Maybe you don't. If you can reconcile, by all means, reconcile. But a lot of people take this Christian idea of forgiveness as if, okay, now I've got to be their best friend. No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm preaching a couple of weeks from now. Okay. It, what, what this forgiveness means is that you release the person into the hands of God, leaving whatever justice they need with God, and you let that go, and you go on with your life. Because if you don't do that, you get between the Lord and the whip, and to hang on to unresolved anger is to open a door to the power of the dark side in your life. You're giving a place to the devil. God said that. Because some of you were here when we learned that the devil takes a foothold and turns it into a what? Stronghold. And a stronghold is a powerful base of operations embedded in your psychology maybe for 20 years or more. That becomes a demonic base of operations for evil and trauma and pain and relational destruction. And it also brings pain into the lives of the people you love. Which leads to another verse from Hebrews, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And this does not mean that you didn't get saved. It means that you got saved. But, and then when you get saved, all this grace, all these resources and blessings become available to you, but you're not using them. And the result of that is, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this, many become defiled. What is bitterness? Bitterness is unresolved anger. It simmers. Bitterness is unreleased vengeance. I'll show him. I'll show her. I'll slander them. I'll, I'll make sure everybody knows what they did. I'll make sure that everybody hates them. Bitterness is unresisted victimhood. Oh, they got me. They got me. I, I'm ruined. Push back against that. It's a lie. Bitterness is unchecked labels. And when all of that is running through your soul like a carousel in the deepest part of your heart, you begin to develop a sophisticated excuse for taking revenge. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? If you walk around with a chip on your shoulder, it means there's a root of bitterness in your soul. This is the consequence of labels. All this needs to be pulled out by the roots. And I would say that bitterness is the middle name of American culture today. It is justified. It is rationalized. It is used to rationalize violence. So many in our culture exist in a constant state of grievance. This is sad. This is unhealthy. This frays at the fabric of our communities and friendships. By this, it says many become defiled. And when life, and it will, slaps labels of doom and gloom on you, you have two paths you can take. One path is the path of grace in which you acknowledge this pain but reject the negative label. This leads to forgiveness in you and it makes you a tender person who is safe for other hurt people to be around. The other path falls short of the grace of God and that turns you vengeful. You refuse forgiveness. You open up to dark powers and the anger simmers either under the surface for years and years and years till it finally explodes into violence that is verbal, physical, emotional, or most often it's violence that turns back and boomerangs in on yourself and now you become self-destructive. This is the biblical wisdom on the operations of the human soul. When those labels come in, there's something you've got to do. So, this is our lesson for who you think you are powerfully impacts how you choose to live in love. And most Christians don't get this and most churches don't operate this way. Because as a pastor, I could preach a thousand sermons on how you should behave. But if who you think you are is broken beyond repair, your, behaviors, your changed behavior is going to last for about a minute. Because you're always default 
Back to who you think you are, the labels. Your identity determines your actions. So if people act out of who they think they are and if who you think you are has been damaged, then that's where we need to work. If you embrace the labels, uh, these labels create self-fulfilling prophecies. If you embrace the label that you're stupid, what kind of person do you think you're going to be? If you embrace the label that you're a loser, what kind of life will you create? If you embrace the label that you're better than everyone else, you're going to be hyper-competitive and also fragile when you lose. If you embrace the label, I'm entitled, you're going to be a tyrant. You're going to be a high-tier tyrant. You're going to be a permanent victim, and you're going to turn into an abuser, a bully, and a crook. Your lifestyle will always incarnate whatever self-identifying labels you embrace. It's virtually impossible to grow up in this broken down world without being degraded, discouraged, debased, and disheartened by other people's labels, which is the bad news, but the good news, and this is the last lesson, all those labels of doom and defeat were blasted to bits in the flood of Calvary's love. Say amen. Can you get, praise God. When Jesus died on the cross, he stripped away once for all every demeaning label ever slapped on you by any demented foe. The mean girls have nothing to say to you. The bullies can no longer define you. The stoned out parents and absentee loved ones do not own your emotions. You don't need to spend one more second proving yourself or your worth to anybody. Your worth has been settled once for all. God has folded you into his family of faith forever and has shouted to the heavens, you are my beloved child and in you I am well pleased. (laughs) This is what the Lord says. So we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. You are a new person with a new name and a new identity linked to the identity of Jesus Christ. You are in permanent union with him. Grace rehabs your identity first, and that's what I want to be doing over these next couple of weeks. Because next time, we're going to do something with these labels and keep adding to it all week long. We're going to do something really cool with these. It's not going to show off to anybody. It's going to stay private. So bring this back. Don't lose this thing. So until then, treat this little slip of paper like gold and be sure to bring it back. We have some plans. Don't miss. And the last thing I'll say is that God today is ready to renew you. And there is one label that you can change instantly. And that is the label sinner. You walked in with that label all over you, and it's probably true. If you don't have Jesus, it is true. But if you got saved, that label is gone. You are saint. And that can change today if you would receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And at the very end, we're going to have a prayer team up here, and our prayer team will show you how to do that and walk you through the steps. God is ready to renew you. He's ready to rehab your labels. And though a thousand voices within you scream, this will never work, permanently damaged goods, it's just emotional hype. None of this is emotional hype. This is all biblical theology. God holds out his hands, and listen to this promise, Isaiah 62 too. The nations will see your righteousness. Kings will be blinded by your glory. And the Lord will give you a new name. You are ready for this. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah, you can praise God on that. Lord God, I pray as we go through this week that these painful labels will actually come to the surface so we can name them and finally deal with them. Take a giant step out from these labels of doom and gloom and defeat. And um, Lord, I just pray that the people of this church will know who they are and whose they are because of Jesus Christ. Through Christ our Lord we pray. And everybody can say, amen. Amen. 